My favorite overseas reaction to a full English breakfast came from a flummoxed New York medical student who was presented with the dish for the first time, and he responded with, Why is everything so wet? <laughs> It's true. It's true. Everything gets so wet because you got some tomatoes leaking all over the place with their juices. You got some beans soaking everything up. Ah, oh, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Business. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're new here, what happens is uh, we cover a topic, things that British people think are normal, but others totally don't. Danny writes me a script. I'm going to read it. And then afterwards, our wonderful video editor, Sam, is going to add in some memes. That's what he does. That's what we do. Let's get into it. I feel I should begin. But you didn't. I feel I should begin with a humble apology. No need, Danny, it's okay, you haven't done anything wrong. Not because, I mean, maybe you have. Maybe you have. One thing I know, do, I do a true crime show called The Casual Criminalist. One thing I do know, people hide their crimes, Danny. What crimes have you been hiding, Danny? How many people do you have locked in your basement? Not because I've done something wrong, but simply because I'm British, and we seem to spend about half the day apologizing for nothing. We're a bit weird like that. Sorry. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I do find myself apologizing for no reason. Like, I'll just, like, be walking down the street and be like, you don't hold, you You know when you, like, you step out of a store and you all, you look behind to hold open the door and you're like, oh, no, it slammed in someone's face. You're like, oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. And everyone's like, what the, it's fine. <laughs> British people. Oh, man. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, fuck off. Sorry, I'm if some clumsy idiot steps on my foot, I'll apologize. Yes, yeah, true. It's true. Both people will apologize. We'll apologize over. Sorry, sorry. I shouldn't have put my foot there. I, I know. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have stepped and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if a fellow on a commuter train accidentally whacks me in the face with their bag, I'll apologize. If someone randomly attacks me on the street. <laughs> Give me your phone! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I shouldn't have been here! I know it's a rough part of town! Jesus! I'll apologize for taking up so much of his or her time. It's okay, Daddy. We don't need to, like, be gen- You don't- we, we don't need to be like, Oh, yeah, women can be criminals, too. That's okay. It's mostly men. Statistically, it's borne out. We've even been keen to apologize to inanimate objects. A recent survey- <laughs> Really? Of more than a thousand Brits revealed that the average citizen says the word sorry about eight times per day. I'm honestly surprised that that's it. Whilst one in eight of us apologize up to 20 times a day. Yeah, that sounds more like me. Sorry. Sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'm deeply sorry. Sorry for what? I'm sorry! I'm sorry, Dave. I'm sorry, Wilson! Sorry, I'm Wilson, I'm sorry! Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Sorry is not enough. And I deeply regret that. And this behavior baffles the rest of the world. Normal people who aren't quite so uptight tend to say sorry for one of two specific reasons. Number one, to express regret over an action for which you feel responsible. For example, I'm sorry my dog broke into your house and mauled your pet budgie to death. A general reason to apologize. Number two, to express sorrow to someone who has received saddening news. I'm so sorry to hear about the passing of your budgie. Do people have that close of a relationship with a budgie? Isn't it just like a fly rat? Like, what does a budgie give you back? You could say the same about cats, though, to be honest, and I kind of like them. <laughs> but with British people, it's more of an instinctual reflex to any possible situation. And if sorry is meant to be the hardest word to say, why can't we stop saying this? It's really easy to say, and we'll apologize for anything. And then it takes away the value for when you make a real apology. But then you do it like this. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. You do it like more heartfelt rather than, oh, sorry, sorry, hey. It could just be that we're rubbish at being direct and feel the need to sugarcoat any reasonable request with an opening apology. And the rest of the world find it weird that we can't do something as simple as ask a stranger for directions without first apologizing profusely for bothering the poor victim. Excuse me, excuse me, sorry, um, do you speak English? No, I don't, sorry. Yeah, I hate doing this. I absolutely hate. I would never do it. But then you'll also find, like, I went back to the UK for Easter relatively recently at the time of recording this. I hadn't been to the UK for like two and a half years because of COVID. And uh, I just totally forgot how people will say things to you. Like I'm walking down the street with my dad and some guy just comes walking past and he goes, Hey, father and son, father and son. Because my dad's also bald and has a beard. He's also, like, about this much shorter than me, but I, we look enough alike. 
And uh, I was like, oh my god, this is so... What do I say? No one does this in Prague. No one would ever say this. They'd just look down. They wouldn't make direct eye contact, and I prefer it that way. And then we were walking across to Sainsbury's. I was, with, I was also with my dad. It was on the same bloody walk. We're going to Sainsbury's. And uh, Sainsbury's is closed because it's Easter and we see this. And some woman comes past and like, Are you guys going to Sainsbury's? Sainsbury's is closed. I turn around. And it's like, okay, thanks. Yes, what's wrong with people? <laughs> what do I say? I've forgotten how to be British. <laughs> Why do we talk to each other in public like this? <laughs> But also so reserved that we can't possibly talk about our real emotions and feelings. It can also be deployed as an act of passive aggression. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, oh, oh I'm so sorry. Love sarcasm. Love it. For example, if someone asks you, I'm sorry, but are you in this queue? This is just a polite way of saying, can you either queue properly or get the f out of my way? But perhaps the truth is that we feel apo- But that- But perhaps the truth is that we feel apologize- But the perhaps- Perhaps the truth is that we feel like apologizing for no reason. Well, we can't even speak. Yes, I can. But perhaps the truth is that we feel like by apologizing, it'll help us get what we want. During an experiment in the UK, an actor approached several groups of strangers and asked if he could borrow a mobile phone. When he came straight to the point, he only had a 9% success rate. But when he prefaced the request with an apology for bothering them, the success rate shot up to 47%. Of course it does, because you don't want to give your phone to someone who's just rude to you. Hey, mate, can I borrow your phone? F*** off. <laughs> Hi, excuse me, I'm really sorry to bother you. Could I just use your phone for two seconds? I've lost mine, and I really need to call my wife. Boom! Even if it's all a lie, you're gonna succeed, you Machiavellian f***. I should have left you on that street corner where you were standing. The sad part is that we've kind of devalued the apology and turned it into a form of repetitive social etiquette over anything truly meaningful. It's hard to be profoundly moved by the word sorry when at least 10 other people have apologized to you today for absolutely nothing. And I'm sorry to say that it's not the only peculiar quirk about UK citizens that the rest of the world find deeply odd. Oh my god, Danny. I thought we'd moved away from extremely lengthy introductions and here we are! Greetings from Blighty. I didn't know Blighty was short for the UK until I swear to God I was in my early 20s. And I was somewhere, I was traveling, like, I don't know, backpacking or whatever, you know, as young British people are wont to do. And uh, I was just having a chat with some guy and he's like, oh yeah, yeah looking forward to going back to Blighty. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> what the hell is even that? I'm just going to take a leak. Blighty. What is Blighty? What was it back then? I don't even know. <laughs> Honestly, probably didn't have a smartphone. I don't know what I did. I'm kind of elaborating for the sake of storytelling, but I didn't know what Blighty was. British people are judging me right now. It can be difficult enough to get past the very first sentence thrown your way by a Brit. Tourists visiting the UK for the first time are often taken aback by a complete stranger appearing to show a sudden and deep concern over their health and well-being. And that's because a popular British greeting runs along the lines of, You are right," Which is often shortened to, All right. <laughs> It's weird. It's like, how are you? Hi, how are you? You all right? Yeah, it's like a casual, how are you? you all right, mate? Yeah. How you doing? You won't hear that in slightly more reserved company. It's only likely to be heard in certain parts of London and way up north. I don't know about that. If you're all right, you're right. I'm from the south. I'd feel people would say you're right. I don't know, I've been out of Britain a long time and Danny lives there. I don't know, Danny. Sh if you venture as far up as Yorkshire, oh, careful. <laughs> don't go that far north. <laughs> Get steady on, steady on. My nan's from Yorkshire. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off. Bing, 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 bing. I don't know what that means. Does that mean I can be racist against Yorkshire people? Can you be racist against Yorkshire people? Probably. It's 2022, isn't it? How do Yorkshire people speak? I've totally forgotten. It's barely, it's barely comprehensible. The grit, my nan didn't speak like she was from Yorkshire. Like my, my stepmom's from Birmingham. That's where she, she was born or grew up there or something. She doesn't speak like a Brummy. My nan doesn't speak like she's from Yorkshire because if you come to the south, people judge you. <laughs> the grit's like, you stop speaking like that. Speak English. The greeting may even be her, have evolved into, all right, all right, really? 
The problem here is that new tourists can be worried over whether being asked if they were right. Do they look lost? Or they're about to burst into tears? Or keel over and die in the street? But don't be fooled into thinking that anybody really cares. <laughs> it's largely just a rhetorical question wrapped up in an informal greeting. I suppose it's the British equivalent of, What's up, dude? <laughs> I like that one as well. What's up, dude? <laughs> yeah. How you doing, mate? Hey. There can be a little confusion over how exactly to respond, though. There's no... Okay, I'm going to think about it before Danny tells me the answer. You all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all right? That's the response. You all right? Yeah. What? Person one. You all right? Person two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all right? Yeah. That's it. That's all. That's how it goes. That's how we greet each other in Britain. Although Danny thinks it only happens in the north. Racist. There's no need to get all defensive and explain that there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Your safest bet is to simply respond with, all right, you. Yeah. <laughs> this will lead to another, all right, from the other side, <laughs> which hopefully wrap up this fascinating and insightful verbal exchange. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? If you're feeling a bit more adventurous, you could plump for the other typically half-British responses to the question, such as, mm, not too bad, mustn't grumble, still breathing, or living the dream, pal, living the dream. <laughs> I love it. But don't be too worried if you get it wrong. Even some British people misunderstand the greeting and take the opportunity to start waffling on at length about how utterly miserable of a time they're having. Yeah, those people have no social graces and they should be put in some sort of prison. They don't usually get asked a second time. Spilling the beans. Ah, the great British diet. Scotch eggs. Toad in the hole. Jelly deal. Fish finger sandwiches. Mr. Brain's pork What? 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 And another vintage UK dietary custom is the concept of smothering absolutely everything in baked beans. We bury soggy toast beneath a whole can of beans. Half a can of beans, Danny. Half a can. We pour them over jacket potatoes. And yes, some peasants can't even be asked to heat them up in a pan, referring to just scoop the cold beans out of a can with their fingers. <laughs> Danny, the, the peasants don't do that. What are you talking about? I've seen peasants from a distance. And they don't do that. Although baked beans are often seen as quintessentially British, they were first introduced over here in 1901 by the American Henry Hines. What? My life has been a lie. Who didn't have quite as much luck shifting them on his native soil. Of course, Americans occasionally eat them too, usually as a barbecue side dish, but the US is bewildered over as to why Brits go quite so mad for baked beans and eat them throughout the day from breakfast to supper. You can have them with every meal. Every meal can have baked beans. I love baked beans. I also love baked beans with barbecue. They're slightly different. Also super good. There's a barbecue restaurant I go to. I've been to a couple of times. It says I sound like I'm a regular there. Actually, I've, I've only been once and I ordered from uh, I ordered takeaway food from them another time, but it's delicious. And it comes with the side of American barbecue beans. With a barbecue, they do go better than regular beans, but regular beans are better, generally. Like, you wouldn't want those weird barbecue beans for be breakfast, that's for sure. There might be a little confusion over the fact that baked beans taste sweeter and more sugary in the US, where sugar is naturally added to absolutely everything. Everything. In contrast, beans in the UK are reassuringly bland, but that's <laughs> reassuringly bland. I feel like British culture is reassuringly bland. It's like, yeah, it's been around for a really long time, and over that time we've really sanded down all the edges. So it's just a bit dull. Except for all the knives that we carry around and stab each other with. Those are decidedly pointy. That's a little gay. Hold on. But that still doesn't explain why we're so obsessed with drenching slices of toast with plain old bland baked beans in watery tomato sauce. Incidentally, even the name is a lie. Baked beans aren't even baked. They're pre-cooked through a steam process. It might just be that baked beans are both incredibly cheap and incredibly convenient to reheat in a pan. They're not incredibly cheap, though. They're like a couple of, isn't it like one, it's like one pound fifty, two pounds a can, I feel. Maybe two fifty, I don't know, is that? God, I don't know how much baked beans cost. I'm just realizing that I only know the price of baked beans here in Prague, where they're going to be more expensive because they're obviously imported from the UK. I don't know how much they are in the UK. Danny, I'll trust, that, trust in you that they're cheap, all right? They seem cheap, right? It's beans. Bro, bro. She made fucking beans. What the fuck? When my old financially challenged housemate used to go on his weekly shopping trip on Gyro Day, it was a usually a remarkably simple operation. I made a video before about Gyro, and I I, I felt slightly, and but I felt like I'd lived slightly a privileged life. Um, when all the British people were like, Simon, you know what gyro is? It's benefits, like the government money that arrives, and people call it a gyro because 
Apparently the checks from a bank called Gyro or something like that. And I had no idea what this was. And I was like... I felt a bit out of touch, to be honest. And slightly embarrassed. And now I'm reliving that embarrassment a little bit. Anyway, he just used to pick out a tray of 24 cans of baked beans priced at around 4p a can! No! Danny, this must have been like the 1920s! 4p! How could you get so many calories for so little money? That's absolutely mental. One hour later. Okay, I just had to have a quick Google about cheapest baked beans in the UK. Um, yeah, I got my estimation about how much that costs wrong. Even the fancy beans are a pound. Um, which is what, like a dollar twenty or something. You could get, and I didn't even look very hard, but one of the top results was five cans of something like Hungry Beast baked beans for a pound. That's 20p each. I don't know, how is world hunger a thing when there are cans of baked beans for 20p? And I know, I know, look, that was a joke. Don't take it too seriously. I understand why world hunger is still a thing despite the fact that there are baked... Do I understand? I don't know. I think he might have picked up a couple of loaves of bread as well. Of course, you'll always find baked beans served up with that other curious British tradition, the full English breakfast. The epic early morning feast would probably be considered a bit heavy by normal people. It dates back to the early 14th century when the upper classes would serve guests with a ridiculously lavish breakfast to show off the wealth of their estates and the quality of the meat and vegetables in the local lands. Nearly a millennium later, Scruffy Bob regularly pops into the greasy squirrel cafe to order the same sort of thing for about a fiver. Five pounds? Five pounds? That's a steal. Holy shit, really? The mountain of food dished up on the full English breakfast plate includes sausages, bacon, fried eggs, mushrooms, toast, grilled tomatoes, hash browns, and maybe a spot of black pudding. Love black pudding. It's probably my favorite thing. It's like one of my favorite things about going to like hotels in the UK and you have breakfast and it's like nowhere else in the world do you get black pudding. And then a UK hotel will just be like, look at that black pudding. I'm like, yes, yes. A revolting concoction. Danny, come on. Made a congealed from pig's blood and congealed fat. I know it sounds disgusting, but it is good. I promise. And of course, you're going to find more baked beans slapped all over that too, along with a few puddles of ketchup. My favorite overseas reaction to a full English breakfast came from a flummoxed New York medical student who was presented with the dish for the first time. And he responded with, why is everything so wet? <laughs> It's true, it's true. Everything gets so wet because you got some tomatoes leaking all over the place with their juices. You got some beans soaking everything up. Yeah, it is wet. That is a le and the, even the, the like fried tomatoes, they're kind of juicy. <laughs> That's a really good reaction. Ah, you're afraid to get wet. But I have to admit, I enjoy a full English now and then, minus the abominable black pudding. Oh, you watch your mouth, Danny! How else are you going to recover from the previous night's massive doner kebab? Someone to wash over me. Where do you keep your washing machine? Oh my god, this this blows my mind. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Are washing machines in the kitchen? What the fuck, Britain? I remember going to my my nan had a washing machine in the kitchen. Where I grew up, we had a f***ing room for washing machines. It was just like it was a utility room. And there'd be washing machines, the boiler was in there, there'd be like a big rack for laundry, there'd be a little toilet where you go to take your shit away from the main bathroom. Like, I mean, separate, like, it was like you'd walk through the utility room to get to the toilet. Or you could squeeze one out. And then, but some, like, some people have the washing machine in the kitchen, which is so strange. In Czech, where I live, the washing machine is in the bathroom, which I find equally weird. Like, the, I bought an apartment a few years ago. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off! Bing, 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 bing. Move in, and I'm like, there's a big slot for the, the washing machine in the bathroom. And I'm like, well, that's coming out of there. We're redoing that. So block that off and put the, wa put the washing machine in the utility closet. There's a utility closet for a reason. It's just empty. <laughs> That's where the washing machine goes. Weird. For a long time, I assumed that any sane person would shove their washing machine under a countertop in the kitchen. Danny, no. But apparently only the UK and a few other European countries consider this to be a sensible move. The rest of the world thinks they were absolutely disgusting. It's not disgusting. It's just... I mean... It, where else... If you don't have a utility room, where else does it go? I guess you put it in the bathroom. I don't think that's particularly good either. 
Living room, that's weird. Bedroom you can't do because you want to run it at night and get that off-peak electricity. I have to say, kitchen or bathroom? Bathroom does make more sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it, Britain? Come on. It's only now that I stop to think about it, I suppose it could be seen as a bit icky. We're handing dirty underwear in the very same room, which we're simultaneously attempting to reheat a can of baked beans. Just opening the door of the washing machine unleashes a wave of bodily emissions and salmonella and fecal matter into the kitchen. It does? Oh my god, germs are horrible. And then for an encore, we're later dragging the clean clothes out through a smelly kitchen contaminated with bacteria and cheesy beans. I gather that Americans generally prefer to stick their washing machines in the basement. Yeah, of course, of course. But if you don't have a basement, what do you do? Or make use of a separate utility room? Again, what if you don't have a separate utility room? So why don't we do the same? Well, it's because we're so poor, or at least it's because our matchbox houses are among the tiniest in the Western world. It's crazy. Like, there are these charts that compare house sizes. And I always feel like, here I live in quite a big apartment. And I'm always like, this is quite nice. It's quite spacious. And they look it up and it's like, oh my god, I'm such a peasant compared to Americans in their giant apartments and houses. It's like, what the f***? <laughs> it's because in Europe there's so many more people and so much less space. <laughs> We generally don't have any space for a fancy utility room. We don't have basements with plumbing. We're more likely to have a pokey cellar with just enough room to dump a knackered old bike. And only two suitably plumbed rooms to park a washing machine in a typical British home would be the kitchen and the bathroom. And our strict building regulations dictate that power sockets in a bathroom can only legally be installed if there's three meters from the bath and the shower to the socket, ruling out that option in most cramped UK bathrooms. They definitely don't have that same rule in check because there are just plug sockets in every bathroom and i always found it weird and then i'm like well when was the last time i got electrocuted i've been electrocuted from the mains once and it was horrible but i'm 34 years old it's happened once in my entire life and i was like oh my god and i had a little lie down and then i was fine what are you fucking stupid <laughs> The Germans often shove their washing machines in the bathroom, though, as they have no such qualms about risking low lethal electrocution on a daily basis. Same for the Czechs. So, to put it simply, and it makes more sense, it does make more sense than in the kitchen. So, to put it simply, we put our washing machines in the bathrooms as there's no other logical place to put one. On the plus side, British washing machines tend to be more innovative and compact than their US counterparts. We use front loaders, which can be shoved under countertops, whereas Americans tend to use top loaders, which naturally require more space. I didn't understand top loading ones. I mean, it's just because America, you've got so much space, America. Everything's giant. Like the houses, the food, the people. You Americans, wow, penis so big, so big penis. Well, I, I guess it is a pretty good size. But with the, the front loading ones, like in my apartment, we got the washing machine and then stacked on top of that, you got a dryer and, or is it the other way around? Oh God, I don't know. But like one, it makes more sense for the washing machine to be on top, right? Because then you could just grab the heavy laundry and but i think ours is the other way around which is weird weird that means that if you live in a small u.s apartment you're more than likely taking your dirty washing to the local laundromat yeah which is even more insane like i would rather have my washing machine on my dining room table than i have to go and use a laundromat a concept which laundry went out of date in the uk in about 1987 yeah because we're not peasants i know Seems we are with our tiny, tiny houses. <laughs> and our front loader systems and higher standard voltage combine to make our machines spin faster so the clothes come out much less sodden before we hang them up to dry in the garden. Americans probably don't care much about this as they're far more likely to make use of a dedicated dryer. Yeah, I mean, I live in an apartment, so you gotta have a dryer because you know in a garden. And I don't wanna seem like some peasant hanging my clothes out on the balcony. Because then other people in my building would do it, and then it would be like this ugly mess of clothes drying on the balcony, like we're living in some sort of slum. And be like, please don't. No, no, no. There's probably an ordinance against that because you never see people drying their clothes on the balcony. And it makes the whole city look nicer rather than just a dump. Well, excuse me, princess. I imagine they typically keep it in the West Wing dryer room next door to the dishwasher chambers. <laughs> the stupid bloody TV license. Here we go again. Ah. And finally, here's the thing which really makes the rest of the world think the UK is utterly bonkers. It's illegal to own a television set unless you fork out £159 every year for a TV license. <laughs> It's not illegal to own a TV set. It's illegal to watch broadcast television without the paying the £159 a year, which is more expensive than Netflix. So in my opinion, like I haven't had broadcast television. They have a license here in check as well. And I just don't buy it. And I send them a letter like an, they call it an honest declaration. You have to write in this form saying that you don't watch broadcast TV. And I feel like at some point that's got to switch around, right? Because most people are not going to be watching broadcast TV. It's like I just watched Netflix and the the, the, the other ones. 
future's now, old man. And every penny of that goes into funding the radio, television, online services of just a single corporation, the mighty BBC. Now, this might have seemed half reasonable when the TV license was first introduced in 1946 at an annual cost of £2, as the BBC was the only channel on the air in the UK. But in the year 2022, when every viewer has access to content from literally hundreds of different broadcasters, it seems a tad unfair that you're not legally allowed to watch any of them unless you fund the BBC. This is insane! We need to get rid of this immediately. What the fuck? Whose services you may not even care to watch. And in fact, the concept has arguably felt outdated since the emergence of rival independent TV broadcasters way back in 1956. I get the feeling it's not going anywhere. Rise up, people. They can't find you all. Um, except, yeah, they can. Yeah, they can. But they probably can't prove it. So just if everyone refuses to pay if enough people refuse to pay the tv license refuse to let the inspectors go into your house which they can't do unless they've got like a, a warrant and they'll t the, the tv people have to go to court they'll have to get warrants all of this sh if enough people do that it they'll they'll be a huge problem mi6 and just to be clear i'm not encouraging you to, to commit a crime here i'm not encouraging you to do that even though it sounded like I was, I'm not. I'm just speculating, and I would never encourage that in any way. I'm not even joking. Am I joking? No, I'm not joking. Am I? No. Believe it or not, jail right away. A big part of the controversy is that the people most likely to try and get away with dodging the TV license are the people who simply cannot afford it. A couple of hundred thousand license evaders are prosecuted and fined up to a thousand pounds every year, and it does feel as if the poorer members of the audience are being targeted in a pretty heavy-handed way. For several decades, the TV license marketing campaigns used scare tactics to intimidate the audience into coughing up, warning license evaders that TV detective vans were patrolling the area and ready to strike. When you saw a van on your street, this was often a cue to quickly unplug your TV and hide it in either the utility room <laughs> or more likely the bath <laughs> very few details were ever revealed on how exactly these tv detector vans worked and there's some debate over whether they really worked at all or were just very elaborate visual props they were just props no one believes these works <laughs> And although the campaigns are much gentler in nature these days, anyone who doesn't pay a TV license for whatever reason, say they haven't got a TV set, can still expect to regularly get bombarded with letters and knocks on the door from TV license inspectors. <laughs> really? I never had this when I was in the UK. And I always paid my TV license like a good boy. Except one year when I lived in university halls and I had a TV and I didn't pay the TV license because I didn't watch TV. I played Xbox on my TV like a normal person. It's not, and I, I, and I definitely didn't pirate anything. I would never do that. I definitely wouldn't pirate TV shows that you don't have ads in, that you can watch whenever you want, and then watch them on that TV via an HDMI cable. I'd never do that. Why would you do that? It's wrong. It's not all bad news. If you're registered blind, you can claim for a discount on your license, but only a 50% discount. You get half off if you literally can't see the television. <laughs> Fuck you guys. Fuck you. You dicks. I'm not sure if people who are both born blind and deaf get a bigger discount, but I'd also like to think that it raises to at least 60%. In their defense, the BBC claimed that the license fee helps fuel the unique non-profit public service, which remains independent from advertisers, government initiatives, and agendas. Well, tell you what, BBC, look what works quite well. F***ing advertising. Because you know what people do? They watch the advertising on this video, and they get to watch it for free, and I don't have to charge them. And guess what? Guess what? If they want to, they can pay for YouTube Premium, in which case, they can watch without the advertising it's less it's less than the price of a tv license per year what is going on this is insane perhaps they've got a point but they may need to rethink the future budgets as the government recently announced that the tv license is finally set to be scrapped when th when the current charter expires at the end of 2027 just stick some adverts on there it'll be fine i see a future in which the bbc is entirely funded by raid shadow legends and honestly, I wouldn't have a problem with that. It's fine. We all know what's going on. We all know that when I do an advert or when you see an advert, I'm not like, I'm obviously getting paid for it. I explicitly have to say it's a sponsorship and then I'm getting money in exchange for talking about this thing. Not Raid Shadow Legends because I've never done an ad for them. And every time they email me, I say that I want an absolutely insane amount of money. And they always come back and are like, mm, yeah, we can't do that. But they still write to me. One day they're going to say yes. 
And I'm gonna buy myself something cool. Clothes. Treat yourself. Fragrances. Treat yourself. Massages. Treat yourself. Mimosas. Treat yourself. Fine leather goods. Treat yourself. And yes, many years ago, I did once get fined for not paying my TV license. Danny, no. For that, I can only offer an entirely disingenuous British apology. <laughs> thank you, Danny. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, me. Thank you for watching. Click on those ads, baby. Get whatever the sponsorships are cut in later, but whoever sponsors this video, go do it. You know it. You love it. Whatever it may be. I feel I should begin. But you didn't. <laughs>